In this lecture, we're going to discuss a one-way ANOVA or a one-way analysis of variance. We'll start with an overview of what analysis of variance or ANOVA actually means, and then we'll describe in more detail what a one-way ANOVA or a one-way analysis of variance is. And then we'll talk about the statistical assumptions underlying a one-way ANOVA and finish up by talking about statistical significance and practical significance in the context of a one-way ANOVA or analysis of variance. And so let's start with that overview. So an analysis of variance, or ANOVA for short, they're like t-tests because they're designed to compare means. And specifically, the analysis of variance is part of a family of analysis aimed at comparing means specifically three or more means. Although we can actually use an analysis of variance to compare two or more to two means, but there's some reasons which I'll explain in a moment why we would maybe decide not to do that from an interpretation standpoint. Now there are different types of ANOVA. There's the one-way ANOVA, repeated measures ANOVA, factorial ANOVA, mixed factorial ANOVA. And in this lecture, we're going to focus specifically on the one-way ANOVA or the one-way analysis of variance. So a one-way analysis of variance is very similar to an independent samples t-test. In fact, a one-way ANOVA can be used in place of an independent samples t-test. However, I don't necessarily recommend this. And the reason I don't is from an interpretation standpoint. Yes, you can get to the same result. However, there's different layers of interpretation that get added when you're doing a one-way ANOVA as compared to an independent samples t-test. In fact, I would liken it to going to the corner store in your Ferrari to, picking, to pick up a bottle of milk when instead you could just walk around the corner on foot to get that bottle of milk. Now, the one-way in one-way ANOVA refers to the fact that a one-way ANOVA has a single predictor variable, or which is sometimes referred to as a factor or a factor variable. Now, a one-way analysis of variance requires a nominal categorical or ordinal predictor variable with independent scores or observations for cases um, in each level of the variable. So in other words, let's use an example here. So let's imagine that we have a predictor variable in, that is categorical or ordinal in nature, such that there are different groups of people within each level of that variable, or they have their different scores from different groups of people in each level of that variable. So an example of this would be perhaps you have three different facilities in your organization, facility A, B, and C, and you have different employees who are working at each one of those facilities. And let's say that you want to compare the average or the mean performance levels of those employees across these different facilities. Well, then you could use a one-way analysis of variance because you have a categorical predictor variable, these three facilities, and no employee is working at multiple facilities in this example. They're each in independent facilities. So just like an independent samples t-test, we have independent groups here. So no one is in multiple groups. Each person is assigned to only one level or group. And these levels correspond with that nominal or ordinal predictor variable. Now, an analysis of variance, specifically a one-way ANOVA, requires also an interval or ratio, or in other words, a relatively continuous outcome variable of some kind. In the example I just provided, let's assume that performance is measured in a relatively continuous way. And that could be the outcome that we're comparing in terms of the mean between these three different locations or facilities. So what are the statistical assumptions underlying a one-way analysis of variance? Well, the first assumption is that the outcome variable has a univariate normal distribution in each of the two or more underlying populations. And those two or more underlying populations correspond to the two or more groups of interest, which are those levels or categories for that nominal or ordinal predictor variable. Now, the other assumption is that the variances of the outcome variable are equal across the two or more populations. And again, these two or more populations correspond to the two or more groups of interest, which are those levels or categories of that nominal or ordinal predictor variable. Now, another name for this particular assumption, this is a second assumption, is the homogeneity of variances assumption for a one-way ANOVA. So what does the assumption of univariate normal distribution look like in this context? Well, we can use a histogram as an example to visualize whether or not a distribution has that univariate normal distribution. And so using this example here, let's assume this is the distribution of scores or the distribution of scores for that outcome variable for one of the groups. And let's assume there's three groups here. Well, the outcome variable does show a univariate normal distribution for, for this particular group, as we can see that we do have that nice bell-shaped curve here, more or less as represented by that histogram. 
Now we would want to also make sure that this assumption is met for each of the different groups, not just group one, but group one, two, three, or however many groups that you have in this case. And so this is how we would assess or test the assumption of that uninor univariate normal distribution. There's also actually some statistical tests we can use to assess the equality of the, or whether or not those distributions approximate a normal distribution. Now the second assumption again has to do with that homogeneity of variances. And it's particular, it's this assumption of equal variances across the different groups. So let's, for simplicity, assume that we're using the most simple version of a one-way ANOVA here, where we have just two groups and we're comparing their means. And so we're interested in the variances around the means for these two groups, or within each of these respective groups. And here you can see these represented by these two distributions here, which are relatively normally distributed. And so here you can see and kind of eyeball with these distributions that there's about relatively equal variances here. And so the variances, the outcome variables are, are equal between or across each level of the predictor variable. Now, this on the other hand would illustrate unequal variances. And there are some statistical tests that we can use to actually test this assumption like Levine's test, for example. But here is visually what this would look like in terms of the assumption not being met. In other words, there being evidence of unequal variances. So now let's move on to describe statistical significance in the context of a one-way analysis of variance, or a one-way ANOVA. And so statistical significance with analysis of variance really has two different levels to it. First, we're concerned with what's called an omnibus test. We're interested in determining whether or not there are differences in, across the means across all of the means. So not necessarily will we find out, we won't find out this step where specifically those differences are, but we'll find out that there are some mean differences across the means. And really what we're testing here is the equality of the means and whether or not there are deviations from equality in these means. So with a one-way ANOVA, we use an omnibus F test and the associated p-value to test whether any statistically significant differences exist across or between these different groups and their associated means. Now, to test whether specific pairs of those means are statistically different, then we go to the next level down. And this is where we use what are called post hoc pairwise comparison tests. So an example would be Tukey's test. And then we use the associated p-values. You can think of these post hoc pairwise comparison tests. They're, they're essentially t-test, and except they're often correcting for what's referred to as family-wise error. Now, we're going to get into these in a little bit more detail in a second, but the important thing to remember here is that when it comes to an omnibus F test, we typically wouldn't move on to assessing pairwise comparisons unless we find that that omnibus F test is statistically significant, which would indicate that somewhere there are differences across or between the means for these different groups that we're assessing. Okay? And if that's the case, then we move on and do the post hoc pairwise comparisons to actually determine where those differences actually exist. So let's start and drill down a little bit deeper with the omnibus F test and what it means in terms of statistical significance. Now using null hypothesis significance testing, we would interpret a p-value that's associated with the F value that is less than 0.05, which is a conventional cutoff, to meet the standard for statistical significance, meaning we reject the null hypothesis that the means are equal. So again, if that p-value is less than 0.05, we are going to reject the null hypothesis that the means are equal. In other words, we're essentially saying that there are some mean differences here. We just don't know exactly where they are when we have three or more means. Now, if the p-value associated with that f-value is equal to or greater than 0.05, then we would fail to reject the null hypothesis that the means are equal. In other words, we would find no evidence to suggest, at least based on this sample, that there's any deviations or differences between those means. So let's assume that we do find a significant omnibus F test as indicated by that significant p-value. In this case, we move on to those pairwise comparisons or sometimes called post hoc analyses. So again, using null hypothesis significance testing, we would interpret a p-value that is less than 0.05 to meet the standard for statistical significance, meaning we reject the null hypothesis that the means are equal. So whatever pairs of means we're comparing, if that p-value is less than 0.05, then we would reject the null hypothesis that the means are equal. In other words, we conclude that there is a statistically significant difference between those means. Now, if the p-value is equal to or greater than 0.05, then we would fail to reject the null hypothesis that the means are equal. 
Now, typically when you're doing pairwise comparisons, we adjust for what's referred to as family-wise family error. And the idea behind this is that when we're doing multiple comparisons, meaning more than just one comparison of means as we would do with just an independent samples t-test, we're doing multiple comparisons, we need to adjust for the fact that we could be just capitalizing on chance. In fact, if you were to run a hundred pairwise comparisons, it's likely that a number of those are going to be seem to be statistically significant, even when in reality that's really just error that you're finding there. So again, we essentially deflate the p-values, or rather inflate them accordingly in terms of to address this family-wise error. And so that way, we're, that way we're not going to reject the null hypothesis when in actuality there is no mean difference. Okay, so now let's move on and move from statistical significance to practical significance and talk about effect size. So effect size and practical significance can be considered at each stage of the one-way analysis of variance. So at the omnibus test and at those pairwise comparison tests. So remember an effect size is an index of the quantitative relationship between variables. And so there's different types of effect sizes that we can use as indicators for pra practical significance in the context of a one-way analysis of variance and for that omnibus test. So we can use what's called the R-squared um, test, which is essentially the variance or the, purport, the proportion or percentage of the variance explained by a predictor variable in the outcome variable. In other words, how much variance or variability is accounted for by knowing people's membership in these different levels of that categorical or ordinal predictor variable in the particular outcome variable we're interested in. Now, in addition, we can also look at eta squared or omega squared. Now, eta squared and omega squared, they're actually going to be very equivalent in terms of their interpretation. However, some people would work in favor if you're gonna choose either eta squared or omega squared, actually choose omega squared because this one actually tends to have less biased estimates. Now, also we can look at what's called Cohen's F. And if you recall from independent samples t-test, we had Cohen's D, which was the standardized mean difference. Now, Cohen's F is the mean difference of each group mean from the grand mean of the data, standardizes the standard deviation of the data relative to the group or the level specific mean. So in other words, you can interpret a Cohen's F similar to how you would interpret a Cohen's D. However, there are different conventional cutoffs in terms of what is a small, medium, or large Cohen's F. Now, I recommend just interpreting the R squared and the Cohen's F effect sizes when it comes to practical significance in the context of a one-way analysis of variance. The R squared value is more easily interpreted because you can actually interpret it as the percentage or the proportion of variance explained by the predictor variable in the outcome variable, which is usually a little bit more intuitive. And Cohen's F, because it is something that's very conceptually similar to a Cohen's D, something that we should be pretty comfortable with if we're working or have worked with independent samples t-test or paired samples t-test. So what are the conventional cutoffs here for small, medium, and large effect sizes for these different types of effect sizes that we can apply to an omnibus test of a one-way analysis of variance? Well, for R squared, a small would be 0.01, a medium would be 0.09, and a large would be 0.25. A small would be 0.1, a medium would be 0.25 and a large would be 0.40. So again, these are meant to be general rules of thumb. You should really consider the context to determine what would be in your organization considered to be a small, medium, or large effect. And essentially that has to do with how, how valued and how important are the stakes in this particular context and um, what do you stand to lose or gain by getting it wrong or right. Okay, so the next thing that we can talk about is the pairwise comparisons and how we actually interpret the effect size and which is an indicator of practical significance. So we can compute Cohen's D just like we would with an independent samples t-test to compare the magnitude of the difference between each pair of means in terms of a standardized mean difference, which is what Cohen's D actually is. So a small by these standards would be a 0 0.20, a medium would be a 0 0.50, and a large would be 0 0.80. And so we can use these to qualitatively describe how big of an effect we got, assuming that the effect we found in terms of the pairwise comparison was statistically significant. Okay, so in this lecture, we talked about what analysis of variance actually is, and more specifically, we drilled deep into what a one-way analysis of variance or a one-way ANOVA is. We talked about the statistical assumptions underlying a one-way ANOVA, as well as statistical significance and practical significance in the context of a one-way ANOVA.
So this wraps up the lecture on one-way ANOVA or one-way analysis of variance. Thank you very much.